Okay, we're gonna get started again. So if you all would like to take a seat. Today's second panel on religious freedom in the Supreme Court was inspired by Rich Wolf's recent piece in USA Today entitled, The Supreme Court May Be Converting on Religion. Well, we are lucky enough to have Rich Wolf himself here today with us to moderate that discussion. And to tell you a little bit about him, he has been a USA Today reporter and editor for more than 25 years in Washington, D.C., where he has covered all three branches of government. He has been the Supreme Court correspondent since 2012, beginning with the first ACA case. He reported from the White House during the George W. Bush and Obama administrations and covered Congress from 1987 to 96. That must have been interesting. <laughs> In between, he spent five years as the paper's congressional editor. Rich also has reported on the federal budget and economics, health care, and welfare policy, and national politics. Before joining USA Today, he was a Washington correspondent for Gannett News Service and a reporter and editor at Gannett Newspapers in New York. Would you please join me in welcoming Rich Wolf? Thank you, and welcome to part two of what should be, uh, what has been already and what will be, I hope, a continuing interesting discussion on this topic. Uh, the piece that Kerry mentioned that I wrote uh, shortly after the court uh, term ended uh, this would have been in early July, basically took um, Justice uh, Alito's dissent in the denial of cert in the Stormans case. Stormans is a case which Kristen will talk much more about, I hope, but it was the case involving the pharmacy in Washington State and the Washington State Ordinance that said that they had to provide uh, contraceptives that they had a religious uh, objection to uh, regardless of their objection. Justice Alito said at the time, and I want to quote him, because this sort of uh, is a centerpiece of our discussion today. He said, if this is a sign of how religious liberty claims will be treated in the years ahead, those who value religious freedom have cause for great concern. And so our discussion today is really going to be um, beyond this Trinity case that will be uh, coming up at some point between December and April. Um, what else might we be seeing in this field, and is the court changing enough with the, uh, the next justice coming on, and who knows what changes to come after that, that we're going to see a real change in the way the court has treated religious liberty cases. Um, so we have an excellent panel lined up, and I want to um, introduce them now. First, we're going to hear from Kristen Wagoner who oversees U.S. advocacy for the Alliance Defending Freedom. She's the senior counsel and senior vice president. She supervises a team of more than 50 attorneys and legal staff and has litigated many religious conscience cases, including the aforementioned Stormans Pharmacy case and another called Arlene's Flowers, both that's a same-sex marriage case, also in Washington state. She has extensive experience in civil litigation, employment, education, nonprofit, and constitutional law. Before coming to ADF, she was a partner at Ellis, I'm going to mispronounce this, Ellis Lee and McKinstry, a Seattle law firm where she participated in constitutional cases involving same-sex marriage, pharmacist conscience rights, and financial aid to religious university students. Her clients primarily included private schools and universities, churches, denominations, and other nonprofit organizations. Next to her is Stephen Johnson partner at Winston, Winston and Strawn and vice chair of its nationwide appellate and critical motions practice. He's argued cases in the Supreme Court and has briefed more than 75 cases there and has argued numerous cases in the federal circuit as well. He's represented dozens of different types of clients in church state matters over 20 years, including the federal government while serving at the Justice Department's OLC from 2002 to 2005. His federal circuit cases have involved technologies ranging from pharmaceuticals and medical devices to touchscreen protectors for smartphones. He's also taught, I mean, he's also handled appeals in nearly every other federal circuit, many state courts, and previously taught First Amendment courses at the University of Chicago Law School. Lastly, we have Louise Melling, Deputy Legal Director and Director of the Center for Liberty at the ACLU. She oversees the organization's work on freedom of religion and belief LGBT rights, reproductive rights, and women's rights. Before assuming this role, she was director of the ACLU Reproductive Freedom Project, where she oversaw nationwide litigation, communications research, 
public education campaigns, and advocacy efforts in the state legislatures. She's appeared in federal and state courts around the country to challenge laws that restrict reproductive rights. So we're gonna go right down the line in order, uh, hear from each of them. I'll have a few questions and I'm gonna try to leave a lot of, quest a lot of time for you all. You've been very patient through both sessions today. We'll, we'll give you probably a half hour or more to ask questions of the panel. So Kristen, you wanna get started? Sure, thank you. Well, for over 200 years, America has successfully protected religious liberty against very important government interests, interests like national security, education, health care. And as the first panel hinted at, I think we're at a point in our culture where we're, we're at a pitched battle. And uh, from our perspective at ADF, that pitched battle focuses largely on whether we will permit the space necessary for those with religious convictions about human sexuality and marriage to be in the marketplace and to earn a livelihood and to be able to speak about their beliefs and freely practice their religion. Um, as, as we move forward, I kind of want to start at a 30,000 foot level because I don't think we, we talk and think often enough about why we protect religious freedom at a broader level and just remind us that the principle behind protecting religious freedom is not one of American invention. It's, it's a pre-political right, it's an inalienable right, and it's grounded in our human dignity as persons, as people, and how we are to live. And it also gives both the atheist and the religious person the freedom to explore the meaning of life, to answer those tough questions that are in all of our hearts. Why am I here? Where did I come from? Who created me? And then to live according to the values and the answers that we find. That is what religious freedom gives us and the protections in it. I think also we can look at research to know that those who are um, re religious in nature, they have external benchmarks that they have to honor about what is wrong and what is right. And those things that are wrong, they cannot do. But those religious convictions also inspire them and motivate them to do more volunteerism and humanitarian work, which helps our economy and it also helps increase a stable society. <coughs> Lastly, I just would add that if you think about it and you look at the history of civilization and nations, we know that those countries that have robust religious freedoms are also linked to more vibrant democracies. There is more gender empowerment, there's freedom of the press, and they have more economic liberties. And I would submit that that's because civil liberties travel together. So even if you're not a proponent of religious freedom because you aren't religious, you should be a proponent of religious freedom if you care about any of the other civil liberties that we enjoy. Lastly, when it comes to the 30,000 foot level, I'll just tell you in the course of representing clients, more and more I'm hearing people come and say, well, just tell your client to just follow the law. That's, that's what the majority's decided, just follow the law. And I would urge you to consider that there are plenty of times where we know the government and the majority has gotten the law wrong. You can think of examples like Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, as well as Martin Luther King. And those men were motivated by their religious convictions to oppose unjust laws. In those situations, we're glad that they took that stand. Now, I'm sure that there are people in the room that oppose all kinds of different things and, and would support conscientious objection for perhaps conscientious objection to war, or to lethal injections for death penalty cases, um, or in other instances as well, even abortion for healthcare providers. And I would just urge you, if, if you oppose conscientious objection based on someone's religious beliefs about human sexuality and marriage, but you support conscientious objection in other areas, is the issue the principle of conscientious objection or is it just simply that you don't share that particular belief? And if we're going to be champions of choice and tolerance, then I think we should give choice and tolerance to all people. So I think that's it for my 30,000 foot level. I'll just dive for one minute into the case law. Um, <laughs> In terms of the case law, there are some great cases out there, and I think some of the people that commented in your column talked about those. Recent cases that provide religious freedom protections, we can look at the Town of Greece case, we can look at Reed, which was discussed, Hosanna Tabor, Hobby Lobby, those are all recent decisions that, that protected religious freedom. 
But I'm not going to take a position that I think is intellectually dishonest, and that is to say I'm not worried about the future of religious freedom at the Supreme Court. I am, because I think it's easier to decide cases that are about chickens and beards than abortion, contraception, and LGBT issues. And so as we move forward and we talk about Stormins, which I hope we won't focus on too much because it causes me intense emotional turmoil. <laughs> I was reading it again last night and I thought, I don't want to relive this. This was 10 years of my life. Um, the reason that I have grave concerns about that is because I know the facts of that case and the way that that law was developed and that it was targeted to specifically, their, the state's own witnesses agreed on the stand at trial that they were going after religious objectors to plan B. And yet the Supreme Court didn't take that case after 120 pages of trial court findings and an eight, a 12 day trial. That not only flies in the face of what we should be doing in terms of our jurisprudence and the deference that we give to trial courts, but it was extremely concerning. And so I was glad that at least the three judge dissent pointed that out. Lastly, I'll say this. We are moving to a point, I believe, where it is extremely unnerving to think of the fact that who is on the benches at night justice may well determine whether we send artists to jail, whether we interfere with what pastors and churches teach from their pulpits and in their facilities based on human sexuality, and whether we will banish entire professions from their vocations just because of their religious beliefs. And we have cases that are on their way up to the Supreme Court that involve all of those issues. This is not made up, it's real stuff and real people are affected. So while the dignity of all individuals should matter, and while some may identify based on their sexual preferences, those who identify as a particular religious faith, Sikh, Muslim, Mormon, Jewish, that identity is equally important to them. And we cannot have the law and the government force ideological conformity simply because some are uncomfortable or disagree with the positions taken. So I expect there will be a lot to talk about today based on those comments, and I'm looking forward to sharing the time with you. Well, and we certainly hope that we get some of those cases soon, because if anyone has seen the October and November dockets, uh, <laughs> we desperately need them. Stefan? <laughs> Thank you for uh, inviting me to be here today. It's a privilege. Um, I thought I'd start with uh, kind of your jumping off point, Rich, which was uh, Justice Alito's opinion in, in Stormans. And he said some pretty provocative things about the state of religious freedom in this country. And Kristen has noted some reason to think that it's ominous the way he suggested. Um, I'd like to suggest that um, there's probably a glass half empty and a glass half full perspective on this and maybe even on both sides of the issue. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting, if you look back since 1990, um, this, when the Supreme Court decided uh, Employment Division versus Smith, I'm sure a case many of you know about, where uh, Justice Scalia, writing for the court, said that neutral laws of general applicability don't generally uh, violate the Constitution because they interfere with somebody's exercise of religion. It was the general rule established by the case. And it was a departure from about three decades of past precedent where the court had said, if a neutral law, a generally applicable law, interferes with the exercise of your faith in a substantial way, then the burden's on the government to show a compelling interest, a really good reason um, for enforcing that law, and that its actions are the least restrictive means of furthering that interest. And since that time, um, the Supreme Court has decided a number of cases involving free exercise exemptions, and uh, with one exception, and it's a notable exception, um, the court has decided unanimously in favor of the free exercise claimant in each case. And so we've seen it in the context of animal sacrifice, we've seen it in the context of sacramental use of tea, um, uh, beards for prisoners, um, one of the more notable cases which arose not under the federal religious freedom statute but under the, the First Amendment itself was Hosanna Tabor, which involved the ministerial exception or the right of religious institutions uh, to be free from employment uh, restrictions, employment discrimination laws, and so on. And, um, and I'm for, well, even Zubik versus Burwell, the, the most recent word from the Supreme Court last term, better known as the Little Sisters of the Poor case, the court was unanimous um, 
in rejecting the government's position in a sense that there was, uh, that of the lower courts, they vacated all the lower court decisions saying that um, <clears throat> the contraceptive mandates didn't substantially burden the faith of these nonprofit organizations. All unanimous decisions. So um, there's no question that Justice Scalia's uh, absence will be felt in virtually every area of the law. His voice was not only intellectually forceful, uh, but prominent whether he was in the majority or dissent. Um, but those types of cases uh, are likely to come out the same way. Um, now, the exception was Hobby Lobby, and that was a case involving a conflict between women's access to contraceptives in their, in their workplace and religious freedom, and that was 5-4. So obviously, a notable exception, and a notable exception in, in what people um, call the culture wars. But, but I think it's still notable that there's been unanimity on a lot of these cases. And I think it's also uh, interesting to observe that what has driven the unanimity a lot of times is the least restrictive means component of, of the analysis. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that people on the left and right can sometimes come together on accommodating religious freedom if, if there's some means of accommodating the person that also accomplishes the government's objective. Uh, the government's policy objectives can still be accomplished. And um, you know, I think it's interesting that the court often just stays away from what's a compelling governmental interest in these cases. It just doesn't touch that. It just decides on the basis, well, whatever, however strong this governmental interest is, there's another way to do it, and it includes exempting these people uh, who are raising the exceptions. And I was, so I was preparing for this, I was reminded of George Washington's um, uh, letter to the Quakers in 1789. Um, he said, in my opinion, the conscientious scruples of all men should be treated with great delicacy and tenderness. And it's my wish and desire that the laws may always be as extensively accommodated to them as a due regard to the protection and essential interests of the nation may justify and permit. So I think it turns out that you know, George Washington is not only the father of the country, but he's the father of the least restrictive means test. And, and it's kind of an interesting comment that he makes. He says, if it's really important, if it's essential to protect the country, if they're essential government interests, then religious freedom is gonna to have to give way. But beyond that, we should have a spirit of accommodation and we, and we should seek to respect conscientious scruples uh, that people have with the law. Of course, he was writing to the Quakers who had a conscientious objection to military service. And as the scope of government has grown over the past 200 and some odd years, uh, the opportunity for conflict has grown. Um, but there's still opportunity, I think, for uh, consensus around some of the least restrictive mean type solutions. Um, the last thing I'll say in, is in sort of the, I don't know whether it's 10,000 or, 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 or 30,000 foot level, um, is, is that it's, it's interesting to me the, the dialogue that occurs around the idea of religious uh, liberties and civil rights generally. And I think in some quarters at least, there's uh, a working assumption that, that that religion is sort of inconsistent with the public good, and it's their irrational objections to uh, to secular I, secular objectives, secular policy rationales, and there's sort of an assumption, I think, that. Um, that that's an anomaly in our system. But historically, if you look, it's interesting that it was actually the recognition that government didn't have legitimate authority over religious exercise that led to a recognition that, um, uh, that, go that maybe government didn't have absolute authority over everything else too. And so in, in the late 1600s, John Locke wrote about how, uh, in his letter on toleration, how the government's role and, and authority over religion was limited, it didn't have jurisdiction over religion. And that really led to, uh, that was, you know, in a sense, paved the way for classical and modern liberalism in different way and a recognition that there was a much broader place for different types of civil liberties in a lot of different areas from, from economic to social. And so I do think it's, it's a great topic that we have and it's, it's really a good thing to think about, you know, when, do the government interests need to override? When should government interests give way to religious freedom? And, and this is a broader discussion about civil liberties as a whole, um, uh, not just about sort of peaceful coexistence, but about a broader conception of how broad should civil liberties be conceived. Speaking of civil liberties, Louise? Speaking of civil liberties.
in the ACLU seat down here. Um, I too will go for the, the high perspective. And I think in, in some real ways, Kristen and I probably have a, a top sentence that we share, which is that these are, these are hard times. These are charged times in a particular way in the context of these debates. These are moments of great social change. And at these moments of change, I think people of faith and people not of faith land on both sides of the robust debates that we're having, whether those are robust debates about the rights of LGBT people or those are the rights of women to access different kinds of um, contraception as well as abortion services and other services to control fertility and advance equality. And at those moments of change where the core rules, where the norms are really in process and changing, think LGBT, I think it is as if they're like titanic plates shifting and there are real conversations about where we'll land. And I think now we've seen the LGBT movement advance. We've seen it advance in the face, uh, in the face of very different kinds of objections, including those of faith. And now as those change for people of faith-based objections to same-sex marriage and engaging in and supporting same-sex marriage in any manner, where, where do those people go and where do the LGBT people whose rights are now being recognized go? Those are, those are real. Those are real debates that we've seen before in history. Um, there were real debates around people of faith and institutions of faith that had objections to the transformations with the civil rights movement in the 1960s. There were real debates about whether to have exemptions in the Civil Rights Act for people of faith to step out. There was a business, Piggy Park, in, this, in South Carolina that objected to serving African Americans because the owner, as a matter of faith, believed that the races shouldn't be integrated. It may be hard for us to sort of imagine that now, but if you look back at, at different case law and other things, there was time and certainly people of those faith, those views. In that context, the courts said no, and this goes, I think, somewhat to your question. The court said there was a, a state interest that would override, would override in those contexts in which there was a business that opened its doors. Bob Jones University, Goldsboro Christian um, Schools, objected to integrating their schools, object on grounds of faith. The United States Supreme Court said, you can object, but you won't, you won't get the tax deduction if you're, if you're going to stick with those rules because there's a compelling state interest here that's going to override your claims of religious liberty. In the context of women's rights, we saw schools that objected to paying women the same as men based on a, a philosophical, a religious belief that men were heads of households and deserved to be paid more. And the courts there as well said, you have a right to your belief, but we're not going to let you but you can't impose that belief on your workers in this context, given our advances for civil rights. And I think that's where we are now. I, I understand, I, I mean, I, I readily understand the sincerity of the beliefs and understand, can imagine, the harm of having to face the choice of acting in a manner that's inconsistent with your beliefs, of having to provide the cake to a same-sex couple if that's against your beliefs. On the other hand, there's the dignity interest as well of the couple who's turned away. And that's the couple who was turned away in the 60s, those are the people turned away in 2016. And this is when we come to the other rights, um, I'm doing, you know, in terms of the equality right, if we have a rule where we start to move and we say that there's constitutional protections, there's constitutional respect, for the right of same-sex couples to be the same as other couples in terms, of, in terms of marriage, for example. That right isn't meaningful if when you walk into the door, you can unwittingly be turned away because of who you are. Th that move toward equality, which I understand everybody doesn't agree with, I, know, I appreciate these are hard, but that, that move toward equality isn't real if you're not going to actually sort of be able to live it when you walk on the street, when you go into a business. And so that's, that's what I think is really at stake, and it is, a, it is a controversy that is not new. When I think about where the court is, I actually think and, um, that deep down the court is really listening, and actually really listening in both sides. So I think the court, for example, when you point to Holt and you point to Abercrombie, I think that those are, I'm gonna call them easy cases. 
I think there are easy cases maybe in the context of this debate, perhaps, because I think we could have been, I think we probably were on the same side. Um, but those are easy cases because the court there can respect religious freedom without facing the question of whether it's hurting somebody else. It's a different debate for the court in that context or a different consideration as the court looks at that. Um, when we get to the other cases, however, when you think about Hobby Lobby, for example, in Hobby Lobby, I think that the court in some sense was extremely, from my perspective, extremely deferential to the, to the claims of, of Hobby Lobby in the sense that the court readily said, this is a substantial burden without, to my mind, giving serious consideration to how it wanted to understand substantial. The court didn't bring any independent or objective analysis to that. And so you wind up with a claim and you wind up then straight at the compelling state interest and least restrictive side of the test very quickly. But that's because the court, I think, was, the court was giving serious credence and paying attention. On the other hand, the court even, I believe it's in Justice Alito's, um, says, this is okay because there's, we, there's zero impact on women if women can, if the Hobby Lobby can avail itself of the accommodation. That's a sentence that the court was thinking about the third party harm as well. Similarly in Zubik, in Zubik the court is considerate, the court sends it down because it wants to see if there's a way to respect the religious liberty at the same time as asking whether there's still a way to provide full and equal coverage for contraception for women. I think the court is genuinely trying to listen to both sides, and I think the court, I'm not exactly sure where we're gonna go as, as we go forward, and I think, of course, who's the ninth justice is <clears throat> shall be quite, quite, quite significant as we go forward. Well, thank you all. I have a quick question for Kristen, and then a couple of general questions, and we're gonna throw it open to the audience fairly soon. Um, Kristen, I won't make you talk about Stormans for the, for the duration of this panel, but uh, what are the chances that perhaps when we do get a Ninth Justice, that case or a very similar case is coming back? Well, you know, the crux of that case was basically, there were two main arguments to put it very simply. One is that if the state is gonna allow referral for all kinds of business and secular reasons, then it needs to also allow for religious reasons because it's the same outcome to the patient and you get there under the Smith test. Um, if the state continues to allow secular referrals, referrals for business reasons, um, then the likelihood is quite high. Um, and in addition, um, the law specifically targeted conscientious objectors. The stalking rule had been in place for 40 years and the only person they'd ever gone after was the religious objector in that 45, actually 45 year period. Um, I will also note footnote six in the dissent uh, specifically invites another future as applied challenge um, if the state attempts to try to shut pharmacies down and pharmacists push them out of business. Um, so you, all three of you were talking about um, the court changing uh, in the future. Uh, we know that that change is coming. Um, the change, uh, probably the odds still favor Merrick Garland, but uh, regardless of when the change comes and who uh, the Ninth Justice will be, just talk a little bit more in any order about whether you feel it's Justice Scalia's death itself, whether you feel it's um, Kennedy as the ultimate decider, whether you feel that it's key to who the next justice is, whether you feel perhaps that uh, Justice Ginsburg's role as uh, perhaps the de facto chief justice if it's a, a Clinton administration, which of those um, factors or all of the above are going to move the needle on religious freedom cases? Well, I think they all have a bearing for sure. Um, the, um, you know, Scalia had tremendous influence in so many areas and uh, I think it was just this week that Justice Kagan spoke about his influence on statutory interpretation and how basically his views had uh, largely won the day, and if you compare opinions from the 1970s or early 80s to the way the court approaches taking apart a statute now, you can see that it's that it's true, even though obviously uh, a majority of the court didn't share all of his views. Um, uh, there was an interesting um, post by Mark Tushnet, um, professor, law professor, uh, on his blog. I think it was in May. Um, you know, basically suggesting, you know. A vulgar, a vulgar reference to Anthony Kennedy and saying, we don't need you anymore. 
um, and, and it's basically the left's perspective that they don't need Kennedy anymore. And obviously, that's um, probably going you know too far in a lot of respects. But the the fact that the sentiment was expressed so openly um, shows, I think, the significance of of the Scalia vacancy, um, and uh, and and you know. The, the left has five votes on, on some issues, and depending on who makes the appointment, you know, may have six on, on many, um, and, and on both sides of the aisle. So um, and I think, um, I do agree with Louise that the, the, the court is co very conscientious and sincere about how it looks at the interests on both sides. And I think you see, I think you see wrestling. They, uh, you know, obviously different justices are moved by different things. Um, but, uh, you know, I think you can expect whoever the next appointee is to take that seriously as well. Uh, but there's no question that there's a lot of issues hanging in the balance 5-4. But one of the things that's interesting about Scalia, right, Scalia, Scalia right, Smith, right? So one of the cases that's in the pipeline, or there's a cert petition pending is Masterpiece Cake Shop. So this is the case in Colorado with Jack Phillips' cake shop. Jack Phillips um, declined to provide a cake to a same-sex couple and therefore was in violation of Colorado's law and has raised free speech and, and um, freedom of religion claims going up. Scalia's rule announced in Smith would, would sort of very quickly dis, d, um, take care of Jack Smith's claim, and Jack Smith would lose, right? So it's sort of ironic that Scalia's, to me, um, that Scalia's absence from the court is seen as impairing religious liberty when I share Dan's view that Scalia and Smith went way too far, and the ACLU never supported, you know, going where Scalia did, for example, in Smith. Um, but I do, I do think the question will be whether, which kinds of harms this, the court sees. I think there is, promise, at least, look, our basic view is that religious freedom gives you a right to your beliefs, but not to impose your beliefs on others, not to hurt others, not to discriminate, looking back at, at different cases. And I think there's, you, you see some strains of that in the current, in the current law, and I think that ninth justice will be, will be pivotal in so many things. I mean, maybe pivotal for the kinds of conversations that happen in the court, and also pivotal because of the perspective he or she will bring to the court. So are there cases that any of you think would be uh, subject to complete flip-flops, uh, different outcome, once we have this ninth justice? Stephanie, you were talking about how a lot of these cases have been unanimous, uh, the easy ones perhaps, but uh, in addition to Hobby Lobby, we had Town of Greece, which was a 5-4 case. Uh, and on the tougher questions that pose uh, issues of equal protection and civil liberties versus religious freedom, uh, LGBTQ issues, abortion, contraception, um, those are not the easy cases. Those are not the 9-0 cases. What do we think uh, the, the change in the court, whenever it comes, with the Ninth Justice is going to mean on some of the tough issues? Well, I'll start us off on that. Um, you know, it's hard to predict whether one justice would flip it because we don't exactly know where Justice Kennedy is on some of these tough issues. Um, we know where he is on same-sex marriage, but we also know that in that decision in Obergefell, he very clearly said that decent and honorable people continue to have uh, reasonable philosophical and religious objections to same-sex marriage and that they have the right to continue to live consistently with those. Um, so how that plays out in the real world, we have yet to see. But uh, you know, going to the Masterpiece Cakes case as, as one example, there, there are three cases that come to mind that I think could be very pivotal with this next justice. One is Masterpiece, um, and in that case, uh, Jack, which we represent Jack, he politely declined to do a custom wedding cake, offered anything else in the store, any cake in the cooler, um, but said he just couldn't be involved in a same-sex wedding. And the commissioner um, of the Colorado Human Rights Commission said his beliefs were deplorable, um, he, despicable, I think was the word, and compared them to perpetrators of the Holocaust and ordered his family and his employees to undergo essentially re-education. Um, the Colorado Supreme Court declined to, declined to hear that. And to suggest that the case is just about the Smith analysis, first of all, I, I would take issue with whether we lose under that neutral and general applicability standard. But there's also a very strong free expression component, and it's in, it will be interesting to see what Justice Kennedy and the new justice would do um, in terms of forcing uh, people to engage in expression to create custom art uh, against their will. And we have a case which we can talk about later, Judge Ruth Neely, who 
was just argued at the Wyoming Supreme Court and whether she can be disqualified uh, from her position. And then we have Baronel Stutzman in Washington. She, her case will be argued at the Washington Supreme Court in six weeks or so. And she befriended a gay customer for 10 years, did all kinds of arrangements for him, hired uh, gay and lesbians, had no issue with that, but it came to an event. So again, I think it's gonna be interesting to see in those types of cases how far Justice Kennedy and perhaps the new justice will go. And not just saying you may have the right to same-sex marriage and, and you may go ahead and, and marry, but you also have the right to force someone to embrace what you're doing, to call you the pronoun that you want, and to go ahead and create custom artwork on your behalf. That's something we've never done in any of our jurisprudence. Yeah, I think there are both um, big questions about the overall framework that the court will use to decide these cases. We've talked about Smith and the whole idea of when does a neutral and generally applicable law trump religious freedom or should there be exemptions from that sort of law? Is there a free exercise right rooted in the First Amendment to the Constitution to those sorts of exemptions? And, you know, the truth is, with the exception of, uh, you know, Hosanna Tabor, which did, which was unanimous and decided under the First Amendment, um, the, uh, the court hasn't really shed a lot of light lately on how the individual members view that question. Um, at the time Smith was decided, it's five to four on the issue of how you analyze the claims, um, you know, there was a huge outcry. Uh, there was legislative support for the Religious Freedom Restoration Act from, uh, you know, the ACLU to, um, you know, groups on the other end of the spectrum and um, a lot in between. Um, and there was general agreement on the framework needed to be a framework that respected the idea of individual conscientious objections where the state's interest wasn't strong enough to override. And, and, and I don't think we can, I don't, I mean, people have shifted on that over the past 25 years as these sorts of issues have come up. So I think it's kind of an open question how the members of the court think about that, the existing ones, let alone the one uh, who, who fills the ninth seat. Then in, more in the particulars, you know, there, there are big issues as well. Um, Luis referred to, to dignitary harms and how much, I think it's a serious question, how much do they get? Now, it, it might mean something in, in the race context that's, that's different than in the Stormans context. Um, Justice Alito and his descent from the denial of certain Stormans didn't quite say, you know, no, no burden on the woman. What he basically said was, there are 30 pharmacies within five miles, and you know, there's one within, I think it was 1.9 or 1.7 miles. So the burden on someone to get the, uh, the pharmaceutical product that they wanted was relatively minimal versus uh, the burden on the Stormans if they couldn't act and exercise in accordance with their faith would be to go out of business. So. A big question the court's going to face is, you know, uh, when do symbolic interests, dignitary harms, uh, when are they so important that there can be no, essentially no exceptions, that, that the least restrictive means is not to ex exempt anyone? And, um, you know, I think that that's, a, that's something that varies uh, significantly by context. And, of course, laws like RIFR require the court to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. The one thing I would say is I would just take issue with seeing the dignitary harms as symbolic in the sense that I think being rejected is, is real. Um, that being rejected is real in terms of whether or not you experience yourself as being able to participate in society, whether you perceive, your, whether you believe the promise of equality that has been given you. And I think Kennedy, I agree with you that Justice Kennedy, we don't yet know, and there's, um, the sentence right after the one you quote, which is, uh, is ambiguous as well, but he says, he talks about people, honorable people of different religious and philosophical views, or land on different both sides in terms of a Burgerfeld. And he goes on to say, but when that sincere personal opposition becomes enacted law and public policy, the consequence is to put the imprimatur of the state on an exclusion that demeans or stigmatize those whose own liberty is then denied. I think that, tell, you know, again, Justice Kennedy, we can never be sure how those <laughs> sentences will come into real life, uh, what he'll do in the next case. But I think that suggests he, 
That suggests, I think, in his Hobby Lobby decision does as well, that he's definitely concerned about the impact on, on, on people of being denied. He's concerned about that third party issue, as well as concerned about the religious freedom claims on the other side. I want to put in a brief plug here for uh, Jack Phillips. I visited uh, with him in Colorado, uh, and he does make fantastic cakes and cupcakes. So <laughs> you, should all, you should all try one. Do Not we, for long. <laughs> do we think that, um, you know, the court denied uh, cert on the Elaine photography case, I guess it was two or three years ago from New Mexico. What makes us think, and, and again, this, the Ninth Justice is part of the calculation here, that they would take um, Arlene's flowers or um, uh, Masterpiece Cake or Masterpiece Cake or any of the others. Do, do we think that those are likely? One of those is likely to be granted in the future, or is it still a long shot? I think it's going to be difficult for the court to keep dodging this issue. I mean, I don't know which case it will be, but we know that as these cases are going up, you know, we have a number of cases that are at the trial court level involving videographers and, you know, those kinds of things, as well as cases that are before the state Supreme Courts. Um, so I think pretty soon it's going to have to deal with these issues one way or another. Um, and it's going to have to explain, and hopefully we can in a question later, I won't now, but this distinction between the civil rights Jim Crow era, which is a false analogy to what people like Baronell are saying. They can't participate in a religious ceremony that violates religious convictions. Well, it certainly seems that we're not going backwards. Um, I don't mean backwards. We're not going back uh, on the same-sex marriage question, probably regardless of how the, the court changes. Does um, the whole LGBTQ uh, issue and the power uh, of, of uh, that issue make it tougher uh, for the court to rule in the way you would like to see them rule, uh, Kristen or Stefan, on issues relating to uh, LGBT, LGBT. And I wonder specifically about the transgender case, if any of you want to bring up the uh, Gavin Grimm case out of Virginia, likelihood that they might take that case, how that might come out. I feel like I've been doing a lot. Do you want to start with that? We, we kind of start. Do you, yeah. Well, I can, like, I, I agree with you. I think the court, I often say you could ask my great niece who's 10 what the court will do sometimes and whether or not I'll take certain. <laughs> it's a 50-50 odds and hers might be as good as mine in a sense. But if I had to bet, um, I wouldn't necessarily think they're going to take master masterpiece because I think the, there isn't yet a split in the even in the higher courts of the states. And that, but that I, I too agree that they will take one of these at some point. I just think it's it's too robust a debate for me to imagine that they're actually going to not take one of those cases at some point. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the case Gavin's case out of the Fourth Circuit. I would think it might be too early in the sense. Um, it's the first case, it's one kid, um, and we don't yet have much, much law developed. The Fourth Circuit's case decision was out of a preliminary injunction. I think, of course, they're going to take that issue, mm -hmm. but maybe not yet. I, I lean the same way on that. I mean, it's interlocutory, uh, meaning it's not, there's more to happen in the lower courts. and. Um, but you know we've all been surprised both by denials and by grants, yes. um, and uh, I do think that you know once a split of authority develops and different lower courts are deciding it different ways, then I think that you know even issues that the Supreme Court is slow to wade into, they generally they generally take them up, and we've seen that both in the religious freedom context and in the same-sex marriage mm -hmm. context. So if a split develops on on cases involving you know wedding cakes or mm -hmm the like, um, you know, I think they'll take it. One of the questions I, th I just want to flag because it comes up in the characterization of some of these cases that the court hasn't tangled with, and I don't know whether they will, is whether the court ever wants to get into the business of thinking about the difference between facilitating versus engaging in, in an activity. So for example, for me, the, the questions about the cakes are very different. I mean, the ACLU does not think any, any uh, minister or rabbi has, should be, could be in any manner forced to perform a wedding against his or her beliefs, which, which we see as very, very different from whether a public place, a business that opens its doors to the public and is providing services can then discriminate based on, on faith-based reasons where there's a compelling state interest, such as an anti-discrimination principle on the other side. 
and it and you know some of these things I think this is one of the differences like Zubik uh, known to many as Little Sisters of the Poor was about a form about facilitation an argument that the form facilitated something far along the path and is the court at any point going to draw distinctions other than the sort of the core sort of house of worship distinction in, in how it thinks about objections? Not because the objection isn't sincere from the person who's raising the objection, but rather is that one of the ways the court might think about giving content to substantial burden? Or is that going to be a factor as the court thinks going forward about how it's going to think about the different harms that are argued before it? Let me throw it open. I know there's a question back here, and then feel free to begin to think up some questions for the panel. Oh, I'm sorry. Do we have the microphones uh, available? I caught everybody by surprise there. My fault. Good afternoon. Very interesting. Um, I'm Joe Cosby. I'm an attorney in Washington, D.C. Um, I, I wanted to start out with just uh, noting on Hosanna Tabor, that's an interesting case in a certain way that, of course, you had a, a teacher suing on employment discrimination, and she obviously did get hurt because she was fired, and of course, one of her claims also was that there was a retaliation, which is also against the employment discrimination claims, and in a footnote, the court said, well, that falls under religious freedom, too, because there's passages in the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, that say you can't sue, and you know, even though this is a school, they're allowed to rely on that in this particular case. Um, and also an interesting um, opinion um, by Justice Alito, joined by Justice Kagan, saying, uh, and it's just the two of them, but it's an interesting combination, that the reason for all of this is that you need to have churches, religious organizations as a bulwark against the state. Um, so start with that, but it, that was a case in which there was somebody who was hurt, mm -hmm. and yet you have a nine nothing a, a Supreme Court opinion. Um, I would turn also to um, Hurley, which is a case nobody mentioned, um, the uh, St. Patrick's Day parade case in which the Supreme Court said, that because of First Amendment concerns, I think it was free speech and, um, and the freedom of assembly, uh, that they had the right to exclude people. I'm sure that they're, in fact, I think the arguments against this and why the Massachusetts court ruled against the organizers of the parade was exactly those kinds of uh, dignitary offenses. Um, and I'm really curious, especially since um, Kristen framed it this way, that we're talking about acts of expression, that you know, the, the people are not closing their doors to somebody to come in and actually do business with them. They're just saying, I'm not willing to do A, B, or C, because what you're asking me to do is, to, is essentially speech. You're asking me to take a position in favor of what you're doing, and I don't favor that. You're, you're asking, you're imposing a requirement on me to have forced speech. And the ACLU's position, the court's position, and I think rightly has always been, it doesn't matter who it hurts. And it, you know, whether it's a, um, a, a Nazi parade in Skokie, or burning the flag, or all kinds of other things that people may say that are extremely, you know, uh, making a protest at um, the funeral of somebody who was killed overseas. Whatever it is, th those harms can be really serious and real, but the freedom of speech is extremely important. So A, why is this a freedom of, not a freedom of speech case where the ACLU would say the harm doesn't matter, it's still that important? And B, why is, why is freedom of religion different, especially in view of the analysis of the Hosanna Tabor case, and were any of these cases, Hurley, Hosanna Tabor, or whatever, wrongly decided because they resulted in, in, uh, in a um, harm to somebody that's real? Well, certainly, I think that question's for me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> certainly, um, in the context of Hosanna Tabor, I think you know we could debate uh, the harms 
in, in that case, but I think there the court was really trying to protect the ministry and to, you know, say, to, to hold firm to its view that at the core, at the core of a church, a house of worship and ministry, that, you, that it just wasn't going to get entangled in that. Um, and we don't have, I mean, obviously, right, we don't have rules, anti-discrimination rules that run to hiring of ministers, as in you can certainly choose to hire only men, if, and et cetera. So I think that is about the specialness um, and, and, and deference to houses of worship in a, in a profound way. And I think there is a difference between a house of worship and a cake shop on a street, and between a photography studio that's on the street, and between a hotel that opens its doors up and, and offers itself out publicly for rental, for wedding facilities. Um, in terms of, if we want to think about um, the cases, I mean, and, and the, the expression in these cases, I think these are, these are services, these are goods that are being offered, and they are expressive in the sense, in one sense. But these are, this is, a, this is a cake. These are flowers. These are services that are being held out for sale by a business that has its doors open on the street. And the question of whether or not they can discriminate for whatever reason is, in, to our mind, that's a case of harming others. Once you have this rule, you don't turn away I don't think people would say, I'm interested in the question, what's the difference? Would we have said you can refuse to provide a cake to a couple because they're an interracial couple? I think we would have said, I think the courts, public policy, public opinion would say no, and I think this isn't different. Well, I'll go now. <laughs> I appreciate that perspective very much and disagree with it wholeheartedly. <laughs> um, <laughs> which I guess that's the beauty of free expression. That's why we're on the uh, opposite side of these cases. <laughs> yes, and I think free expression is a, is a basic fundamental uh, tenet of who we are as Americans and one of the greatest things we contribute to the world. And I think that's in jeopardy here. So to, first of all, um, suggest that the cake baker isn't creating expression. We can quibble about that. Now that I know more about how to bake cakes, I would, again, differ there. <laughs> um, and in fact, the Colorado Human Rights Commission actually found that a cake baker that didn't want to bake a cake that they felt was expressing an anti-gay message, they didn't need to bake that cake, but it didn't violate the Colorado law there. But aside from that, in that oral argument, the ACLU attorney actually argued that this law could actually force a painter to have to paint a, com a commission painting against their will. And that's un-American, and it's unconstitutional. You don't forfeit your constitutional rights when you open a business. That, there's no precedent to support that. And this idea that there's this emotional trump card, that some sort of dignity harm where you can trump the rights of others, is not well founded in our law. If you look at the cases of Hurley, you look at the cases of Dale, those were public accommodation cases. And in those cases, certainly, those feelings were hurt. And there were legitimate dignity harms. No one wants to be told no. Absolutely, I would agree with that. I don't want to be told no. But nonetheless, that precedent exists. I mean, think about the father in the Westboro Baptist case who had to sit there and watch these people say horrendous things about his son after his son was killed in Iraq. The jury awarded $10 million to this man, and the Supreme Court in an eight to one ruling said they have the right to express themselves. Certainly there was a dignity harm that occurred under that. So there is no trump card here to not want to have to face someone who disagrees with you. Um, in addition, I because I don't want to run out of time, this whole civil rights analogy I think needs to be addressed very directly because I find it offensive is too strong of a word because I know that it's very sincere in how you're saying it, but when I look back at the history of the civil rights movement, it is not even comparable. You think about the horrific injustices, the African Americans experienced, they stood, they faced the nozzles of fire hoses and German shepherds, they hung on trees, their businesses were burned, they lost their lives. And it was a period of history that's unlike any other. That's why we have the public accommodation law in that setting, to suggest that that is in any way related to marriage and one uh, religious beliefs on marriage, it, it just, it defies common sense to me because marriage between a man and a woman has been a belief that's existed since the dawn of time. All cultures, all nations, all civilizations, all re religions, all races, man and woman. That's not born out of prejudice, that's a deeply held religious conviction that really goes to who we are, why we were created, and goes to our right to live consistent with that. 
So this is truly, in, from our perspective about marriage, from Jack's perspective, it's about marriage. From Baronelle's, it's a sacred covenant. And in Baronelle's case in particular, we can see that it's that because she loved and served Rob for 10 years. She misses him, she enjoyed his friendship. And pretty much every one of our clients has come, come from that same position. So I just needed to get that off my chest in terms of this Jim Crow piece because I don't think it's a correct analogy and I don't think that we should be comparing people that have traditional beliefs on sexuality as bigots. Thanks. Question here, second row. This may not exactly be on point as the case law, but Justice Frankfurter says that all decisions of the court should be subject to a vigorous stream of criticism, which to me and told me are. that justices may not get to the truth, and I'm always, I always like to go to Blackstone, all law has to reflect some divine law. So I want to get to a different little issue. In the key case on marriage, it was a five to four vigorous dissents. An issue was re raised, now we have other justices that are going to be appointed, where they're going to come from, what their background's going to be, we don't know. But an issue was raised relative to Justice Kagan. Should she have recused herself, or should we have some within that issue because of her position as Solicitor General? I know it's not on case law. I'm looking, we see too often that the law is decided by five to four individuals who can be fallible. Is that the... I feel like I'm sort of talking about I'm looking at you. Like I don't want to be a hog here, so... <laughs> I mean, uh, it's been, I worked for the Justice Department um, many years ago now, and um, I don't remember the particulars of the ethics rule, but my, my memory is that, you know, when you've had substantial involvement in something, um, you should recuse. So that's obviously... Um, for a high-level official like the Solicitor General, there's a lot that comes across your desk, and I assume there's, you know, at times, judgment calls about when your involvement really, when you, when you really engaged or whether something was just passing by, and, you know, I certainly uh, respect Justice Kagan's ability to make those calls, and, you know, they're not, they're not, it's not exactly like there's a court to review them, um, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't recall details from the press about about her having substantial involvement in this, you know. So that's all I have to say on that. Well, and clearly she's, she's recused, for instance, in Fisher and, and yes, other justices other have recused uh, when they felt it necessary. So I don't think you're going to get anybody on this panel to second guess Justice <laughs> Kagan. I could hope. <laughs> Questions, anyone? Don't be shy. Back here in second row. Louise, you, you quoted uh, Justice Kennedy's language about how when a beliefs are given the um, force of law, they can demean and stigmatize people. How do you respond to the argument that laws that force someone to violate their conscience demean and stigmatize them? I think that there is a, a real issue. I mean, in the sense that I think that people of faith who are then told that you can't in your business, that in your business you have to serve people where you object, that that's a, that's a real sort of personal harm. I nonetheless think that when we're making societal rules, we're making rules and judgments about how we behave, and we're making, setting norms that are, in this instance, about equality. And when we set norms and we say to people, we are going to end the stigma that you have faced, we are going to stop treating you as second-class citizens, we are going to welcome you and embrace you into our culture finally, that then to say that you can, that is a compelling state interest, I mean, in, in, in the sense of the law. And it is a question about, as the courts are struggling with, how you're going to balance those things. And I think at the end of the day, we all, we all put part of our personal selves aside when we step into the public spaces. We all do certain things as a way of, of behaving, either just as a matter of civility or as a matter of law. And so when we step into these public places, these are public places where we're going to have rules to further equality. And this is one of those transformational moments. <laughs> 
Um, I, I think one of the things to say on the other side is, look, this is real. Before, if you turn somebody, it, the, the norm has been that there was no protection for LGBT people. The norm was that you could just be turned away and you could be rejected because of who you were. You could be rejected in your job, you still can in most states. You could be rejected in housing, you could be rejected in education, you could be rejected in businesses, you could be rejected when you went to the court, went to the court to try to get a license to be married. This is now sort of saying that rejection, that rejection because of who you are is no longer something we're countenancing. So you don't see a qualitative difference between saying I will rent housing to you and, and or I will give you a job and saying I don't want to bake a cake for a specific event? I think, it, I think it is a harm to the principle of equality in both cases. Yeah. Stefan, you wanted to jump yeah, in. Yeah, well, I mean, the earlier question, it referred to the Alito and Kagan uh, opinion in Toz Hosanna Tabor and, and, and their agreement that uh, the First Amendment is a bulwark against state power. And I do think it's instructive to look historically at where um, the abuses of power come from. And it's really, it's the, the entity we need to be concerned about is the power of the state and not private institutions as much. Not that there can't be uh, serious harms inflicted by private people, there can. But one of the things that it's important to remember in this context as you look at the First Amendment is that there's a symmetry to the First Amendment. And one reaction, I think, of some people is, and it's partly justified, you know, well, you know, why should religious people get exceptions? You know, nobody else does. And part of the answer is, well, the First Amendment singles out religion as special, as unique in a certain way. And at times that means that uh, religion gets a special exemption. There are times when the government can't interfere with religious activity where it could interfere with comparable secular activity. I think of the Wisconsin versus Yoder case from the early 70s where the Supreme Court said, you know, if somebody, uh, if a non-religious person had, had raised a claim that they wanted to have their own private system of education, that they wouldn't have gotten to first base with a constitutional claim. Um, but the other side of it is that there, the First Amendment disables the state from advancing religious ideals where it, it's not disabled from advancing secular ideals. And so, for example, the government can engage in a vigorous pro-environment campaign, but it can't engage in a vigorous pro-Christianity campaign. It can engage in an anti-tobacco campaign, but it can't engage in an anti-Semitism campaign. And so uh, the unifying principle is that the government has to minimize its influence on religious choice. And at times, that will impose burdens on others. And the, the, the most liberal members of the court over the past 50 years, Justice Brennan, readily acknowledge this. And, and they don't all strike the balance the same way. But they ask, well, how substantial are these burdens on third parties? And how substantial is the burden on the religious person? And I think, I don't think it's, it's, I don't think the court will ultimately decide these cases by just saying, equality uber allis in all contexts, I just don't think they will do that. I think they will drill down and they will say how serious is the dignitary harm, how substantial is the burden on the claimant, and how do they balance out? Um, you know, some justices may adopt uh, uh, an aggressive or, or on steroids view of Justice Scalia, that you know, every, if it's neutral and generally applicable, end of case, doesn't matter whether it's criminal, civil, context, whatever, but I think most of them will recognize that there's a real need for balancing in this area and that there, there are hard choices to be made. And if we're gonna have a peaceful coexistence in the society, we're gonna have to um, answer some of those questions in a way that allows for accommodation. Um, you know, Milton Friedman said that a society that puts equality before freedom will get neither. A society that puts freedom before equality will get a high degree of both. And so, you know, Equality norms are important, don't get me wrong, um, but these are, they're important dignitary interests on the other side and they, ha they have to be weighed. Question, yeah. yeah. My, my question had to do with the idea of, um, you know, you putting some part of yourself aside to be part of a community. Uh, when does that have to do with your own, you know, practicing parts of your religion versus your sincerely held religious beliefs? For example, that a marriage is between a man and a woman. I feel a little bit like I, well, look, um, 
Obviously, we come in and stand for the proposition that you're entitled to your beliefs and you're entitled to speak about your beliefs and you're entitled to protest and you're entitled to argue vigorously against same-sex marriage and vigorously against all the state laws that are passing, for example, to try to protect same-sex marriage. There are two, the one thing I haven't talked about, which I do want to emphasize, which is we often draw a distinction between institutions and individuals and creating exemptions for institutions as opposed to trying to accommodate individuals. So if an institution, like an entire shop, and I understand that some of these shops are single, may have a single proprietor, but if an institution like a shop has an exemption, that means that that institution is imposing its views on its workers and on anybody who might be coming through. And, and that is harder to, at least, to accommodate in some, in some real way, as distinct from an individual. So, for example, we years ago did a report that pharmacies shouldn't have exemptions, but a pharmacy, if it had multiple pharmacists, could accommodate a pharmacist so that the pharmacist could still hold true to his or her belief, and the, the, the customer would be served in a seamless way. I mean, it, it cared about whether this was a seamless fashion. So that's one of the ways. It really, it really goes back to a, a belief about trying to prevent the imposition of, of harm on others. Uh, this is probably a question for the panel, but how concerned are you about consensus among the Supreme Court justices? For example, the, the analogy was made between the civil rights movement and uh, the gay marriage decision. Why, for example, do you find that there's, do you, are you concerned with the idea that, for example, in Brown v. Board, you had a consensus of justices, it was a 9-0 decision, but you have on the gay marriage issue, it was a 5-4 decision. Does that unnerve any position or does that cause you to have hope because the court might shift on certain issues? How does consensus kind of play into your um, strategy for your cases? I think in, in ter obviously you, you would rather go before the court thinking you'll have a consensus. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know that any of us think we'll have a consensus uh, based on how the decisions have, have come out. So I, to, to me that ship has sailed and, and we're not going to have a consensus. Um, what, I, what I'm becoming increasingly concerned with though is, um, you know, when, when we talk about, Stefan talked about the difference between the government and private individuals. And traditionally we have made a distinction in terms of private relationships and what those, the freedom of association and what those can do. And, and what we're seeing is that the government um, is now getting involved in the matter, in private matters. So not only does the government regulate more, it regulates in areas that are very close to family structures and religious beliefs where before it didn't. And in addition, um, these, we call them SOGI laws, which are sexual orientation, gender identity laws, are being used in a variety of contexts. And, they're, and organizations that are advocating for these laws are not making a distinction between a business and a private person or an institution and the church. Instead, we're seeing these laws actually be applied to churches. We're seeing them go into the church and say, you fall under this and you must do what this law says. Iowa, Massachusetts, and New York all have laws right now where their commissions have said this applies in the church sanctuary, essentially, and it can apply to what the church does. That's very concerning. Or think about forcing Catholic hospitals now, which are religious institutions, to perform surgical abortions. That's what we're seeing. Or the Obama administration's recent regulations where they're forcing individual health care providers to have to violate their conscience and perform surgical reassignments. Uh, those are areas where we haven't seen regulation before, and I think that you know to suggest that this is a very limited context um, is is not accurate. Look at SB 1146, the California bill that was just proposed. They're basically trying to shut down religious schools in California by making their students forego student aid if this bill passes, simply because the school has a human sexuality policy and wants to honor it. So I, I don't want to trivialize this and suggest. This is just about cake bakers. It's about a lot more than cake bakers, and, and I do have hope that the Supreme Court will recognize it for what it is. We have time for probably one or two more questions. Yeah, we have one in the front here. I'm sorry, go ahead. 
And then we have one in the front after that. My name is Thomas Sue, and my question is for the panel, but it's predicated based on a couple of times that you, Ms. Melling, had alluded to something with regard to the substantiality of the burden being imposed upon free exercise. You kind of seem to suggest that uh, you would like the court to take a little bit more of an active role and perhaps, um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but as far as like questioning the substantiality of the burden or at least evaluating it a little bit more critically, um, how exactly does any court, frankly, go about evaluating the substantiality of a burden when you have a free exercise plaintiff who's alleging a substantial burden without, at the same time, questioning their sincerity and the sincerity of that belief? I think it's a great question. I think when I look at, at RIFRA, so RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, talks about a substantial burden, and if you show a substantial burden, then the question is whether the government has a compelling state interest that it's serving and whether it's doing so in the least restrictive means. Um, so there's, there's a question for sure, right? There is, I don't mean a question as in judgment, I mean a, um, is, the, is the belief sincere? And I think there, we, I bet we probably all agree that there's, that the courts are properly highly deferential to that and it's only sort of if you said one day, oh, I don't really care about that and then I can't even think of the example, but it's, it's exceedingly rare that there's an inquiry about whether a belief is sincere and it's Pretty usually only if there's some crazy evidence to suggest otherwise. Um, Prisons. I'm sorry, prisons. It, that, the, that is, prisons that is where it comes stipulated up. and the parties don't dispute it, but occasionally it, in the prisons is disputed. About diets, usually, or something. Um, yeah, the Church of the Filet Mignon. But the word substantial, <laughs> exactly. I was thinking brownies. <laughs> the word substantial was added in, in RIFRA, and so the question is sort of what meaning does that have, and is a burden, the, the reason why I care about what that meaning is, is it's a very, it's very unusual. I, I, I think there's a chance we would all agree as a lawyerly proposition. It's unusual if you come to court and you say, I have a substantial burden and that there would be complete deference to that and you would automatically get to the question of compelling state interest. Usually there's something a little, a little tighter, at least as the first inquiry before you get to the test that's, that traditionally has been viewed, at least in the free speech context, as fatal in fact. Um, and, and there hasn't been a real conversation, at least by the court, uh, certainly in, in Hobby Lobby, a, about how to give substantial content, and then the court instead chose to be extremely deferential, to, to think about so whether it was substantial only based and largely based on the question of what the penalty was on the other side. So if the penalty was great, that was a sign that it was a substantial burden because it would have more coercive factor, more coercive force. I do think that the, you know, the pre-RIFRA decisions, the, the courts, the Supreme Court rate has relied on some of those to determine what the burden is. So if you look at like Sherbert and Thomas, um, you know, where the court found a burden in those instances, including, you know, Thomas involves a case where a guy was making metal yes. that would go into, uh, you know, making war machines. And um, he was shifted to having to make that steel to actually make the, the weapons themselves. And the court said, that is a burden, we're not gonna quibble with that. So I do think that there's some jurisprudence out there that the court has referred to in other situations on it. You no, know, I think there is jurisprudence, but I think they've done, I think the court did a little bit, um, almost more looking, almost on both sides, I would almost say, in, in prior to RIFRA. In the, but I think that's almost because the court was able, felt a little bit freer to actually sort of think about the balance in a different kind of way. Um, I feel as if the court's been a little bit more rigid, and I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong with RIFRA than it was in pre-RIFRA, given the restrictions of the language. Uh, I was thinking about another <clears throat> case. I mean, one of the things that strikes me about this is that the, the sort of forcing, just because you have to go, you go into business, and therefore you're sort of laying aside all your civil rights or your rights to uh, avoid participation in types of activities that you disagree with. So I was thinking about like the Skokie case, which I thought was shocking at the time. I think most people kind of, you know, but you can really sort of understand it and see that there was a lot of, of wisdom in it, right? I mean, you have this public thoroughfare and the Nazis are coming into the Jewish, uh, you know, town and, and they say, well, you're allowed to walk in the suburb. But I don't think, is there anybody who would have thought that any of those justices would have said to the, like a Jewish baker in the, in the you know, or a 
some kind of shop owner, you have to like make a hat for the Nazis, or you have to make a uniform for them, or you have to uh, uh, you know go along with anything they want to do if they come into your store. I mean, I just don't, you know, I, th I think that there's a level at which we have to start thinking about the content in these ideas. There's a real content in the sort of the Christian objection or the Jewish objection to, um, you know, certain kinds of wedding arrangements. I mean, this isn't something, I think one of the things that's kind of interesting is I think the Supreme Court thinks they're just gonna roll over all these religious people and they're just going, I think, you know, Kennedy said this and in the, there was a New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine piece where, you know, well, we did this in the flag case and everybody just, you know, flopped over. You got 20, you know, 2,000, 2,500 years of, uh, of principle behind what, what marriage is. I mean, I, I, you know, I got news for you. Nobody's going anywhere on this. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, if, if the Supreme Court wants to lay down, you know, 100 years of conflict, that's going to get really serious really quickly. You know, make people, you know, participate in weddings that they, or types of, uh, you know, marriage arrangements, or make them start doing abortions. That would help, that'll really work. You know, there you go. Somebody want to tackle that last one? <laughs> I, I, I'm waiting for the question. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take the comment as a final word on this, I think. Uh, and I want to thank the panel for uh, a great discussion. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you, Rich, for moderating mm -hmm. such a great discussion. So if you would join me again, thank you. <laughs> I don't know about you all, but I, I sincerely appreciate a good discussion. And that's what I think we saw today. I think we can be on different sides of issues, but there's something refreshing about having a civil conversation about some of the most important issues that we all are facing today. So I appreciate uh, the, the panelists' discussion I, on both panel one and two, and the moderators for doing such a great job. And to close up, we are going to hear uh, some brief closing remarks from Jordan Lawrence. He's senior counsel at Alliance Defending Freedom. Jordan has extensive First Amendment litigation experience. He, curr he currently focuses on religious freedom and speech issues. He's going to talk a little bit about a case uh, that he was involved in. And uh, I'll let Jordan take it from here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Great panel. So I just want to uh, talk a little bit again about uh, the Trinity Lutheran case. I was the attorney for Elaine Photography, the New Mexico photographer, and there's a lot I would like to say about that, but maybe just one comment to uh, who thought that it, she deserved to lose is I just caution people to arm the government, when they want to arm the government to go after people who refuse to make expression that disagrees with them, because one day the government's gonna change ideology and, but they'll still have that power to go after the dissenters. And that's something we wanna protect uh, a First Amendment right to do. But I wanna talk about Trinity Lutheran just briefly, then we'll have a reception. When the first panel, when they were discussing all the, uh, the various issues uh, regarding Trinity Lutheran, I first encountered those issues back in 1985. I had newly moved here from Minnesota, a fresh graduate from the University of Minnesota, and I had been hired to work for uh, Michael Ferris. Some of you may know him. He, at that time, he had just started Homeschool Legal Defense Association, and he later started uh, Patrick Henry College out in Percival. And uh, he had moved six months uh, before to Washington, D.C. from Olympia, Washington, where he picked up a case from uh, uh, representing a man who was legally blind named uh, Larry Witters. And Larry applied to a program that the state of Washington had similar to the one in Lock v. Davey that uh, gave money for vocational training for people that were blind. And he wanted to go to some Christian college and learn to be a minister. And the Washington Supreme Court had said that the federal free exercise, I'm sorry, the federal establishment clause required Washington state to single out the religious users and exclude them from the program. And Mike Ferris had appealed that case to the Supreme Court and, and about a year after I started working for him, I am sitting at council table at the Supreme Court and I'm thinking, how did I get from Mound, Minnesota, 
the home of Tonka Toys, that's where it started, and I'm sitting at the Supreme Court counsel table and I'm looking at Thurgood Marshall. I remember that if, if uh, I had stood up and if you've been into the Supreme Court at counsel table and extended my hand and Thurgood Marshall would have stood up, we probably would have been able to touch fingertips. That's how close you are to the bench. And uh, you know, here's the champion who won, uh, who got the one Brown v. Board of Education ordering desegregation of the public schools and he's right there in front of me. And uh, that's all I remember about the oral arguments and it was probably good that I did because Thurgood Marshall wrote the unanimous decision in uh, January of 1986 saying, the federal establishment clause does not require Washington state to single out the religious users and exclude them from this vocational training program for the blind. But the court punted on the free exercise issue that is now before the court in Trinity Lutheran. Now it came back to the court 18 years later in Locke v. Davey and David Cortman who was up here was helping Jay Sekula with it. I, I participated in some of the uh, moot courts with that as well. And, uh, and instead of a punt like we gotten back in 1986, we got kind of a semi punt where they said that they're, you know, we're gonna we're gonna defer to the discretion of Washington State. There's this play in the joints between the free exercise clause and the establishment clause, and uh, and they basically said that's the rule. Now, what I think they had in mind, and that's what makes this difference, and, I, and this is why I think that the case Trinity Lutheran is back at the court. They were thinking in a, a situation there, there the, uh, the Josh Davey is asking for the funding of an essentially inherently religious profession, training to be a minister. It's got some historic connection to traditional establishment clause concerns. And the program allows a lot of religious training to be funded by the program. And I think what they meant by that was, we are not, the Supreme Court justices were essentially saying, we are not going to disturb what we view as the Washington lawmakers kind of weighing all these factors and you know, this one is more important than that one and we're gonna allow this, but we're not gonna allow that. And, and they kind of come up with this, this way of doing it and they're saying, we're just going to defer to that. What they did not have in mind was a state saying, when it comes to something like playground services that have nothing to do with religion and have no connection to any historic establishment clause concern, and when the state uh, utilizes absolutely zero discretion evaluation. It's just this chopping block, mechanical uh, exercise of this principle. Churches don't get funding, churches don't get funding. We don't care about the context, we don't care about the situation, they never get it. That's not what they had in mind with Locke v. Davey. And I think that's why they took this case. Now, the direct funding thing does not solve the problem. And I, and I think that some of the examples were brought up and what I hope the court would say is something that, uh, and, and, and take the advice of uh, Justice Arthur Goldberg when he said back in 1963 that the court has to be able to distinguish between real threat and mere shadow. And this is mere shadow, what we've got here. Now we heard about this, so I just wanna think about it. What if there's a government program to get lead out of the water pipes, get asbestos out of the ceiling tiles, uh, that uh, they wanna give grants to eliminate breeding grounds for Zika-bearing uh, mosquitoes, uh, these programs that both the feds and the states have to give money to fortify potential soft targets for terrorism like schools and daycare centers. Now, if you've got this government, a health and safety concern where the government program is directed clearly at one thing and you really need everybody's participation, it's not that everybody's eligible, you need everybody to participate to fulfill the government goal. What you don't need is, oh wait, you know what? As a secondary thought, we gotta just bring in this established state establishment clause issue that really has nothing to do with our main objective, 
and deny funding to the religious groups. So water and lead pipes, lead in the water pipes, uh, sorry churches, parochial schools, asbestos in the ceiling tiles, sorry can't help you with that. Zika virus, we wanna wipe it out in this entire area. Oh, except for the religious groups, guess where the mosquitoes are gonna go breed. And when it comes to hardening soft targets against terrorism, Jewish yeshiva, sorry, we have a state establishment clause that says no direct funding. That to me doesn't make any sense. And I think that that's where the court should draw the line when it gets around to having oral arguments. And I, I just want to read, and I think that what they should do is follow the sentiments expressed by Justice William Brennan in McDaniel v. Patey. That was the case about the Tennessee Constitution denying pastors the right to, to serve in the legislature and constitutional conventions. This points to the status-based exclusion that I think the court has to say is unconstitutional. Justice Brennan wrote, the Establishment Clause does not license government to treat religion and those who teach or practice it simply by virtue of their status as such as subversive of American ideals and therefore subject to unique disabilities. So I hope in a few months, whenever the oral arguments are, we'll see playground equality at the, up the hill here at the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. All right, well, thank you all for your attention and participation today. I really enjoyed the Q&A. Uh, we hope to see you again at future American Culture on Appeal events. Thanks so much, and have a great weekend.